information um, and vision of persons presenting in the gallery will be captured as part of that recording. We recognise that the, the land we meet on has considerable natural and cultural heritage, including thousands of years of traditional ownership by Ghana. Um, elected members, I'm seeking confirmation of the minutes. Can I have a mover? Councillor Stafford to move. Yep. Would you like to debate? Nope. No debate. Councillor Eaton to second. Would you like no, to no. debate? No. Is there any questions from the floor, Councillor Wilkes? No, sorry. I'll... No? Okay. Thank you, Councillor Wilkes. Uh, any further questions from the floor? No further questions. I will put the motion. All those in favour? And against, that is carried. Thank you, councillors. Uh, item three is adjourned business. Neil, chairperson's report. Neil, we go straight to our presentations. And our first presentation is from the Department of In Infrastructure and Transport, DIT, on the um, O'Sullivan's Beach boat launching facility upgrade. So if you could make your way to the lectern and we'll get you started straight away. Thank you. Steve Paul, yeah. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor and elected members of the Onkaparinga City Council. It's our pleasure to be here this evening um, to give you an overview of that uh, the Department of Infrastructure and Transport will be conducting uh at the o'sullivan's beach boat ramp uh tonight i've got a couple of my colleagues here with me somewhere there they are down the back there uh, we have shannon cunningham who is our comms um, officer and also shock hole who will be the uh, nominated project manager for the project everything okay yeah okay okay speak up a little bit Okay, sorry. Thank you. The notes will always make the mic work properly. Uh, project overview. Um, the state government is funding a $20 million program to upgrade the existing jetties and boat ramps. As part of this program, an upgrade to the O'Sullivan's Beach boat ramp will be delivered to reduce congestion during peak periods and improve access and safety for launching the boats. Uh, the project, uh, uh, O'Sullivan's Beach boat ramp, is the only major boat ramp along the 66 kilometre stretch from West Beach to Wirina Cove. So obviously it's um, dealing with a lot of marine traffic and has been severely under pressure for some time. This important infrastructure requires essential upgrade works. Due to the low underlying rock shelf at O'Sullivan's Beach, the boat ramp can, uh, can be constructed in wet conditions. This means we won't be using a cofferdam system where we pump out the marina while we're working. Uh... We will also be uh, maintaining or enabling one ramp to remain accessible during the entirety of the construction project uh, to allow emergency services to utilise that boat ramp um, at all times. The boat ramp works will be undertaken in a sequence that allows emergency services to have the ramp. Now, this uh, will be part of the existing infrastructure and then as we move through the phasing of the project, they will have access to the new ramp. Maritime constructions have been engaged by the Department of Infrastructure and Transport to undertake the works at O'Sullivan's Beach boat ramp, which include um, the southern extension of boat ramp and manoeuvring area, the installation of precast and in situ concrete ramps, the replacement of the existing pontoons, the relocation and modification of existing rock revetments and civil works to reinstate and repair services. Project outcome. 
The upgrade includes the construction of an additional boat lane, installation of a new L-shaped pontoon, replacement of the existing pontoons, and the upgrade of uh, disability access to the pontoons and the car park area. In addition, there will be upgrades to the existing concrete ramps, improved vehicle maneuvering areas, and provision of two new accessible car parking spaces adjacent the uh, boat ramp facility. Maritime Constructions is a leader and a specialist in marine infrastructure solution uh, with highly experienced personnel and specialist plant and equipment. To safely deliver these works, the boat ramps will be temporarily closed to the public from the 26th of April, 2023, to December, 2023. Uh, this is weather permitting, of course. Alternative launch points can be found at the recently upgraded West Beach boat ramp and the uh, Selix Beach and Wurruna Cove. Access to boat ramps will be maintained for the emergency services, as I've said. Public access and safety. Access to O'Sullivan's Beach and the boat ramp car park will remain accessible throughout the works for light vehicles uh, only without trailers. Beach access on the southern side of the car park will remain open to the general public during construction. For safety reasons, there will there may be some restricted access. Temporary fencing will be placed around the site compound. Trailers and heavy vehicles will not be permitted during construction. Barriers will be constructed to move traffic through this area safely. Uh, and accessibility parking will also be made available. This will be controlled, uh, the access will be controlled via two variable message signs which will be placed on Galloway, Galloway Road and at the junction with Main Drive. Main Drive, sorry, I couldn't, couldn't read some writing there. But basically we're trying to discourage the um, heavy vehicles or, or boat trailers and um, uh, boats from coming down into the area with the restricted movements with the uh, temporary compound. Uh, we now have a site occupation plan that delineates the area of construction. Um, the main uh, work office, uh, lay down areas and delineation for pedestrian walkways and safe access to the beach. This will be maintained with water fill barriers um, to maintain safe delineation between pedestrians and traffic. <clears throat> Construction traffic will access the site predominantly by the road via Galloway Road and Marine Drive. The signage and VMS project signage and VMS boards will notify the local community and ramp users of the closure of the ramp and the project period. VMS boards will be located on Galloway Road to prevent turnarounds being required. Community connection. Uh, notification going to local community will be managed uh, via our comms team and liaising with the council officers. Uh, working with council to align the kiosk refurbishment uh, in parallel with our construction period. Uh, regular community drop-ins in sessions to advise on uh, construction methodology and providing uh, community uh, insight into the specialist field of marine construction and additional signage and social media posts to reinforce the uh, positive outcome of the works as they progress through to the end of 
2023. All right. Community connection. Uh, members of the public are encouraged to register their details with the project mailing list to receive project updates and information as it becomes available. And obviously, we'll have a, a dedicated website there for uh, people to register their interests. Uh, this is an exciting program for DIT, um, and, and uh, I'm sure the city of Onka Paringa, um, it's been on the uh, waiting list for some time to upgrade this asset as it's reached uh, its effective lifespan. Um, following the construction uh, of the revised boat ramp, um, the uh, asset will provide many, many years of dedicated service to the community and with additional um, improvements in safety and also ad additional treatments to support uh, DDA uh, accessibility to the marine asset. Uh, I know all my team are looking forward to getting started on this project and uh, one of the early activities from engaging with maritime services has been to expedite the uh, development of the reference design to secure a type of pontoon that is widely regarded in the industry as um, the Rolls-Royce of pontoon. It will be of concrete construction and although uh, it is um, specific to the Onka Paringa uh, a Sullivan's Beach boat ramp. It is um, customised uh, utilising a proprietary system. Uh, the, uh, because we are working in um, a wet environment, we'll be removing the boat ramps that have shown significant um, damage over the years. And we'll be lifting those uh, boat ramps out. The, precast planks and we'll be installing the precast planks directly through the water um, in a, a specialised frame which allows us to work with divers and get the work uh, done in that condition. Uh, in addition to that um, the increased car park um, spaces for um, DDA compliance will provide a seamless access to the facility, which has not been in place to date. That's an important upgrade. Uh, that's probably all I've got to say at the moment. And I um, thank you for letting us present to you tonight. And uh, hopefully- Perfect, thank you, Steve. Are you um, happy to take some questions from the elected members? Certainly. Deputy Mayor Fisher. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, as in name, also in uh, nature at times, I am a Fisher. Um, so you take you take a boat ramp of that size out of the equation for eight months. The public messaging that you talked about in your third to last slide, I think, is very important that you communicate the correct message um, because nine out of ten people will come back to the council and say, why is this so, when it's not our responsibility. So that's one thing. Second thing, any delays, and any project always has delays. So what sort of um, ideas have you got in that space? We're working closely with Maritime um, to mitigate the design delays. <clears throat> My worry is that the if the design was uh, inhibited up the front end of the contract, that would place us under construction pressure as we move through to mobilisation. And the pontoons play a clear role in that. Our planning um, at the moment has ensured that um, there will be some dredging in the uh, in the um, revet between the revetment rock wall, and uh, we have a lock-in date for that commencement of work and a fully endorsed um, environmental plan to facilitate the works in a timely manner. We do talk about weather permitting. It's a little bit of a um, I guess, a, an insurance clause to say, you know, if we experience construction problems, especially when we're talking about car park modification, sub-base, uh, asphalt works, et cetera. But if you consider 
the methodology of constructing under wet conditions, I think it's safe to say that a little bit of rain is not going to impact our ability to move on with our program. So I believe that the team has uh, addressed um, the major risks to the construction of the project. And our goal is to actually better the December day. And the public messaging? Public messaging will be dedicated comms team and they will be reinforcing the um, uh, drop-in sessions and also the information sessions and regular updates of where the program is and how it's tracking against the baseline. I think the more we keep people involved in this project, uh, because obviously we are disrupting uh, while we're constructing, um, the more engaged they'll be, the more supportive they'll be, and we'll mitigate the amount of um, community uh, backlash that we receive during the construction of the project. Um, our services also include a lot of bridge works and we experience the same sort of um, public inconvenience. So it's imperative that we keep everybody engaged in the project and promote it uh, in a way that uh, uh, encourages or gets people excited about the next season. Councillor Wilkes with a question. Yes, please. Okay, so thank you for your presentation. That was really informative. Uh, this is part of my award, so it's very exciting. I have uh, heard lots of chatter about the excitement happening and how it's going to be a great revamp. So it's uh, especially when you call it the Rolls Royce of pontoons. Mm. Um, my first question is, will this affect the car parks on the site? We will maintain, it will have some impact. Um, if I could go backwards in the, I think I've got controls here. Uh, backwards, yeah. Okay. So you can see that the um, light brown area is um, the affected area. Okay. Yes. So that, that area will be cordoned off. The yellow uh, line there indicates a pedestrian and traffic movement. Um, so there will be still a significant area of car park for uh, beach goers. I, th I was meaning, uh, I understand that's temporarily, but in the long term, will it affect car park car parks in the space? Uh, it's actually a reduction in the islands. Okay. Uh, the, the way the islands are set up. Yes. Uh, and so we're reorientating that to um, reduce the size of the islands and provide provide better turning movements for the. Uh, Boats and trailers. Uh, and trailers. Okay. And the two additional um, DDA yeah. registered. Yes. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Um, now, I'll just confirm that the drawings are available to the public on the website that you mentioned. A deep. Excellent. And then, uh, oh, I'm not sure if you're aware of the original car park, but I was wondering, does the concept plan um, include line markings on the, on the original car park? But, and trailer parking because that's been an issue i've had quite a few constituents ask about line markings and, and trailer bays actually written on the ground of the car park do you know if that's included in the scope of works yeah yep. for the holding area yeah, after, yeah for the trailers in particular like you know that long section in the middle where that's correct so in the holding area that will all be newly marked well that okay but not not the main part of the trailer. The trailer. Uh, through, through the chair. Thank you. Um, the works, works in the car park works are going to be in that brown, oh, it's changed now, but it, within that zone. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the car park isn't going to be line marked until we're going to just let the works complete and then we'll have a look at some some line marking. I know, I know the area you're talking about and that that where the beach access point is in the DDA park. So we'll look at that once once the project's been been okay. yeah, completed. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I appreciate that. And my last question is you mentioned dredging of the sand, and I was just wondering how many times you will be doing that, how much sand, and where is the sand going? Um, that's a separate division from us. Um, they were going to dredge uh, next year, mm -hmm. um, but because it shuts the um, boat tram down for about two months. We have uh, spoken to them to try and run it from current so that you know, we don't open it later in the year and we shut it straight off. Um, so the actual EPA process of that is happening as we speak. Okay. Um, 
and there will be a survey first to make sure there's enough sand to remove. Um, that's just the process. Um, but yeah, that final detail is not really what it is. Okay. I would assume um, because of the previous EPA license, they will have the same approach as the last time. Okay. Thank you. I have no more questions. Councillor Rollat with a question. Uh, yes, I have a, a question, uh, Chair, th uh, through the Chair. Uh, just interested in the spread of uh, uh, cost uh, between council and uh, state government. Is it state government funded totally or? The uh, majority of the project, uh, I would say, is under the state government budget. Yeah. And I believe the uh, council is making a small contribution towards the DDA compliance within the car park and the kiosk. Am I correct there? Want to ask yeah, go right ahead. Yeah, uh, through the chair. Um, yeah, back uh, during our advocacy role in getting this um, upgrade happening, we offered up 35000 to help with modifications to our infrastructure. So our infrastructure is everything above the high tide. Um, and so we did offer up 35000 towards modification of our infrastructure and, and includes the, the new DDA car parking that's going to be put in place. Um, but it's it, when Steve mentions it's a small contribution is a small contribution compared to the I think one point eight million is it total cost yeah let's keep going yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, through the chair mm -hmm. uh, one more question uh, the the number of bursts is that in increasing uh, with the, the yes. new plan yeah so there'll be at the moment you've got two three operational um, boat ramps yep. and with the new configuration you will have four yeah, terrific. and there will also be an L-shaped pontoon on the southern ramp southern pontoon it, it'll actually turn left and head south so there'll mm -hmm. be more areas for people um, to enjoy uh, yes, sitting on the ramp watching um, their boats being made. Yeah. Councillor Patton with a question. Thank you very much. Um, this is in my ward too, so I thought I'd better stand up and uh, ask a pertinent <laughs> question um, through the chair. Um, in, during your presentation, you spoke about leaving one of the boat ramps open uh, during construction. Is that only being left open for emergency services? That is correct. Yeah. And if that was to occur, do they have a, a safe route of access through the... Yeah. Yes, they do. We will be in um, community, the, the government did, and also the um, nominated contractor will be liaising with uh, emergency services so that there will be um, an established action plan so they will have dedicated access to that ramp and the launching facility at all times. Now, obviously, as the project moves through its various phases, we'll maintain that level of consultation. So there'll be no uh, issues with once we change our phasing of the project's life, that there'll be a dedicated uh, plan in place to, uh, as so as to not inhibit um, the emergency services. Councillor Bell with a question. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. That was a lovely presentation, a really exciting project um, in the area. Just a question about the, um, uh, I'm just wondering how many boats do use the ramp throughout the year? Do we know how many boats would use it? I haven't personally been involved in the uh, traffic count, but from uh, information that was supplied by uh, one of my other project managers, He's actually taken vision where there's quite a lot of traffic. Right. So up. I imagine that would obviously cause quite a bit of dis disruption. Yes. Uh, through the chair. Um, yeah, it's, it is council's responsibility to manage boat launchings and, and, ta and taking yeah, the boat launching fees. So we do have those records um, yeah, dating back and it's quite an important part to yeah, justify the, the, the massive upgrade for it. So yeah, we do certainly have it. Oh, look, I... I 
couldn't sure. tell you the numbers right now. It's all right. Yeah, that's but, okay. But if, that's if, if, if you can take it on Just notice, interested. Yeah. That's all. And and just one quite a little uh, extra question. Um, you've obviously started engaging quite a bit with the community about it. Have you had quite a bit of good feedback? And um, does it in currently include a big sign out there highlighting that it's happening? I might um, uh, invite Shannon to come up and just talk about the communications and some of the plans. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us. Um, so in regards to early engagement, yes, between DIT and the construction company, we've already um, established stakeholders that have been mapped in the area, obviously looking at the things that have been provided by council as well, to different boats that are being used, different recreational uses. We've already been having conversations with all the emergency services as well as others. Um, so they're very well versed in how we're going to use the northern side at the start and we'll be continuing those conversations and how they access that. And then obviously when the southern ramp is built, we'll be changing that access over. So there won't be any surprises, which we're hoping for. Um, and we're hoping to continue that engagement as we go um, and being very open. This is where that community drop-in situation is coming about and we elaborate on that a little bit more for you. Um, in the past, when we've, especially in maritime, it's very closed off, it's not very open to the, to the public. We want to do this one a bit different. So each month we're going to be there on a Saturday. We're just uh, establishing the dates right now for about half a day because we did a survey and most people are available on a Saturday. So we want to go with what's going on in the community because we don't just want to be building for the community. We want you know, them to be a part of this. So um, what that will do is by coming down to the site, they can have a chat to the project team. They can um, give us any feedback that they have. They can raise any concerns while we're there, whilst also actually looking at the site in a safe manner. So this is something we're piloting, and I'm pretty excited about that from an engagement perspective to be able to do that. So we thank you in advance. Um, is there anything else that you want me to elaborate on? No, fabulous. Councillor um, so, uh, oh, Deputy Mayor Fisher with another question. Yeah, sorry, it's on public messaging again. So uh, it's the angle you need to meet and discuss. So car parks is one thing, but there are online forums that represent these groups and the numbers would be in thousands of, that use that. And West Beach is a long way from O'Sullivan's Beach and we're in as twice as far as West Beach is as well. So there will be significant uproar from the community in relation to the boat ramp. Absolutely, and I'd, I'd like to address that, Mr. Fisher. So, uh, in respect to uh, marine users, we have already done an update that's going out to all marine users that is over the course. So, they're very aware of this. This is why we're getting out of BMSs very early. This is why we're having signage that will be going out tomorrow. Yes, BMSs are going out tomorrow in the locations that we discussed earlier today. So, we're hoping those inquiries start coming in well before we're looking at actually being on site and having that established. The other part to this is also having, for people going down there, we'll be having signage out next week um, and it has our contact details there as well, as well as a QR code. So they can go to the QR code, go directly to our website and have those conversations. We don't envision that we're not going to impact people. We totally understand. We've been speaking to different recreation users, as I said. Um, we have had some of the sailing clubs actually defer their winter season at this stage and be reopening in the summer. We're also aware of some international fishing that's going on, and we're trying to work with them about um, if they can maybe extend it a bit closer to December than November because we want to, you know, embrace all the things they do. So, yes, we do very aware that there's lots of people. We do understand it's an inconvenience, but there is two locations available. So we're happy to have those conversations with constituents if they're having issues. Councillor Rillett with another question. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, just a question to the Council. Uh, have any revenue projections uh, been made and also the ongoing uh, maintenance cost once the whole thing is established? Thank you. Uh, through the Chair. Um, yeah, we'll have to take that on notice. Question on notice, thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Eaton with a question. Well, it's just mainly to do with the uh, your engagement. Have you been speaking to the Trailer Sailor Association of South Australia? Because um, they're not necessarily like the Christie's Beach Sailing Club or anything like that. They're a bigger, bigger boat, and uh, they're the sort of boats that take a lot of time to get ready to get into the water. So just 
it would be a good idea for you to engage with them particularly. Okay. Absolutely. And we'll take that online Thanks. and ensure that they are definitely okay. part. Um, if memory says, because it's quite a list, believe it or not, um, we wanted to go out and above and beyond for the stakeholder mapping <laughs> of people that were using it. But thank you for providing that information and we ensure that they are definitely on the list of contacts. Um, as I said, we are still hoping to capture quite a lot of marine users um, with the Mariner updates that people go to on the website as well. So we're also going to be doing a lot of social media as well. Um, leading up to the opening and during, during different milestones. So we're hoping between these different lines and having, you know, information on site prior to the um, site being established that we'll be able to capture a lot of people maybe we haven't written down. So please feel free to have that feed through to um, council of any concerns or people you think should be addressed. Councillor Roulette with another question. I just related to the uh, previous comments, uh, Chair, uh, to the council. Uh, any ongoing maintenance of that uh, system, will that be covered by state government or by the council, seeing the council is getting revenue from the launchings? Thank you. I can just uh, let you know that the um, asset will be maintained by the state government. The uh, but I think the only area that pertains to the council is the actual car park and the kiosk. Thank you. And that's exhausted all of the questions. So thank you so much for your presentation. You're free. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank yes. you. Um, elected members, we're now moving on to deputations. Um, we've got one deputation today from Darren Chandler, CEO of the Sample, uh, to talk about South Adelaide Football Club. Um, Darren, if you'd like to approach the lectern, you'll be given eight minutes to speak. Um, when there's two minutes remaining, a chime will go off to give you a warning, and then I'll open it up to the chamber for questions. And we also have Neil Sharp, the CEO, here to answer questions, many questions from elected members as well. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thanks for the opportunity um, to speak tonight. Um, yeah, Darren Chandler, CEO of Sandful. Um, absolutely privileged to be in that role and to be able to look after football in this state at every level. Um, it's not just a Sandful competition. Um, it's from uh, Auskick right through to senior men's and women's football. Um, what does a sample do? Um, I thought it was important that we just cover this off um, because a lot of people do believe we just run a sample league competition. And uh, our vision is to connect communities through the enjoyment of football at every level. We're very much community orientated. And I know that's um, very uh, similar, I guess, to the, the vision of the council. I talked about it before, Auskick, school football, club football, women's football, multicultural, First Nations program, wheelchair football, inclusive football. We cover off everything we possibly can to get as many people in the community throughout the state and obviously down here in the Southern area involved with our game uh, and to um, better their lives from being part of it. Football's um, the most popular organised sport in the Southern area. We're really proud of that. And um, working with the South Adelaide Football Club and the Southern Football League as well, um, we've been able to achieve that. And um, uh, But we're not uh, resting on our laurels there. We know from a participation point of view in the Glenelg zone, um, compared to the Glenelg zone, I should say, that we need three times as many um, young people between the age of nine and 16 to get the same outcomes in terms of participation. So we need to work harder, we need to work smarter, we need to do things a little bit differently to get those participation outcomes. The purpose of uh, the presentation tonight is not only to cover off what the Sandville and the South Adelaide Football Club collectively do in the Southern area, but also share our vision for quality facilities at our league clubs and our community clubs um, but obviously still, we're very, very interested um, to cover off why it's so important to upgrade the facility at Norlunga at the South Adelaide Footy Club. We, uh, we work in zones within, the, within South Australia. Every one of our league clubs has country and metropolitan zones. The South Adelaide Football Club does an amazing job working down here not only the Southern Footy League area, um, but also the Great Southern area and Kangaroo Island. The Sample employs full, four full-time um, staff to work 
in football down in this area. Combined with the staff at the South Adelaide Football Club to give young people the opportunity to play a game at whatever level that may be. In terms of women's football, it's worth noting that South Adelaide lead the way. The Southern area, um, the Southern Footy League women's competition is the biggest women's competition outside of the Adelaide Footy League and the South um, Sandford Juniors competition. And it's a credit to the work that's been done down here, combined with the success that the South Adelaide Football Club have had in the women's competition. They've run two out of the first three premierships. They're currently sitting top in the women's competition this year. Their development league is also sitting in the top two and they're doing an outstanding job in this in that space. One of the other things that we've uh, you might have heard a gather round has been promoted a fair bit at the moment. The AFL gather round happening um, not this weekend, the weekend after. Um, we've played a major role working with the state government to bring this to South Australia. And uh, we didn't want it just to revolve around Adelaide Oval. We wanted to get as much uh, activity happening around the state as we possibly can. And so there's a number of things happening down at Norlunga. The Western Bulldogs are training down here. They're working with the South Adelaide Football Club to deliver in coaching courses, opportunities for kids to be involved with clinics, and uh, trying to make sure that we get as much activity as possible. The AFL did review Norlunga as a potential site for games to gather around. There's one reason why they didn't get it, and that's facilities. The facilities down there are not suitable and not up to the standard necessary for an AFL game and, uh, of the minor round. Um, Norwood was successful in having two games. And when you look at the $10 million that's been spent on that facility over the last five years, um, it's easy to understand why they were successful in actually um, securing those games. In terms of what the South Adelaide Football Club does, and I know that Neil has probably spoken about this previously, but it's worth noting that Sandville Clubs and the South Adelaide Footy Club are community clubs that focus on talent. It's really, really important. We use the word elite a lot in sport. Sure, we provide talented players an opportunity to get to the highest level, but they're community clubs that are, that are located down here in the southern area providing opportunity for young players. Under 13s, under 14s, under 15 boys, under 16 boys, under 18 boys, reserves competition, the league competition. The girls, under 14 development squads, under 16 development squads, the development league and the women's competition. Nearly 500 players, of which only 6% of those players at the South Adelaide Footy Club this year are playing league footy. They're much bigger than a league football club. And the other thing worth noting, the number of players that um, go through the um, South Adelaide Footy Club, the majority of them actually finish up back at their community clubs as leaders, as better players, as coaches, et cetera, giving back to the game. Just quickly, um, I just wanted to note, and I'll move on quickly from this one, that the no longer Oval, uh, Flinders University Stadium, is on show around the country. Channel 7, AFL Streaming, and Sample Now. So it's on show the whole time. We're invested more than just the, the game, the football. We're trying to create opportunities for fans and people to come to games and enjoy themselves. There's more investment going into this um, than ever this year. I talk about facilities specifically and what's happening at the other venues. Combined combinations between um, state government, federal government, local council, the AFL, the Sandful, Nord Oval, $10 million, change rooms, coaching staff facilities, food and beverage outlets, media facilities, spectator amenities, function rooms, gyms, picket fences around the Oval, lighting up reads, video screens, you name it, they're being done. And as I said before, Norwood's leading the way. Prospects just finished a major upgrade, the North Adelaide Football Club there. Sturt, Heard Sue Dewing on the, on the radio this afternoon on the way down there, CEO of the Sturt Football Club. The investment that's happened at Sturt, it's one of the best venues now in the, in the competition. 11 year, years ago, they were nearly broke and the place was falling apart. Central District, amazing transform, transformation happening out there. The investment from council together with state government out there is um, 
as extreme lights, change rooms, women's facilities, etc. Glenelg Football Club uh, video screens just gone up. Change rooms were done last year. The, the facility the is improving all the time. I guess um, leaves us to to South Adelaide, and I don't like saying this, but without doubt, the worst facilities we've got in our competition. Now, I understand the current challenges with the ownership of the land, um, but I, I, I guess I come here really today, tonight, um, to ask Council to work as hard as we possibly can with State Government, with the South Adelaide Fo Football Club, with Sandville, to find a way that we can develop the South Adelaide Football Club and no longer able to a level which it needs to get to to provide the young players, male and female, from in the southern area an opportunity to progress their footy careers to the highest level they can. Because at the moment, and as we go further ahead, the kids from the south are going to get left behind. And that really worries me. Thank you. Elected members, do we have any questions? Councillor Jew with a question. Um, I've got a, got a couple, actually. Um, I wondered how, so I absolutely see the value of sport um, and I have worked with young people so realise that young people sometimes struggle in school but sport might be an outlet or something that they're good at. How do you make, um, at a South Adelaide footy club or even in their SADFL, how do you make um, sport accessible financially for kids to have those pathways and opportunities so it still remains grassroots and accessible? Absolutely. Well, um, football... I can say, because we've done the research on that, it's the cheapest sport to play, bar none. Um, we, uh, we have programs, um, obviously, uh, registrations at Clubland are dearer than schools, but in comparison to other sports, they're still the cheapest. Um, we have the, the government um, sports subsidies available that uh, families can use to make that even cheaper, and we advocate um, with government on that all the time. Um, and we also run school programs. So the kids, if they can't afford or, or don't wish to play in club programs, can play school football. And I think the fees for school football are about $60 this year. Mm -hmm. And we provide a lot of resources to make that um, as accessible as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, this might be a very narrow-minded question, but I'm willing to ask it. Um, what's the economic benefit um, and also the benefit to council by um, participate, you know, engaging with you to develop and create what is the potential vision for this space? I haven't got the exact numbers for Lydia probably yet to tell me, but um, we've done some economic um, reports, which uh, I think we've passed on to the council and we do that again, um, which highlights um, the, um, the millions of dollars um, that are the, the, um, a benefit through health benefits, um, through uh, just being, being active. There's a the whole range of things that um, um, we can provide and, and cover off, but they're extensive and they're in the millions of dollars in value to the community. Could we ask to be provided with that? Absolutely. That would be great. Um, and my last question, I'd heard a rumour a little while ago about how Cardon and South Adelaide were going to go into potential partnership with the, the property, the land in between. Was that not quite accurate? I was, in, was interested to see where they got to. So... Carlin have uh, purchased, from what I understand, have purchased the land from the state government between us. And... Yeah, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, Carlin College have um, purchased the land between us and the school. Mm -hmm. But we are in partnership with Carlin College over the building of lighting facilities on their own. As well. okay. It's the AFL and, and us and the state government. <clears throat> Can I get you to press your button? Okay. Go ahead. Um, and so my last question is, so um, are you wanting better playing facilities or are you wanting better infrastructure? Like what's the priority for the club? Well, our change room facilities are currently 28 years old and they were built at a time where there was no female, very little female involvement in that sport. And our numbers, I mean, our teams have probably doubled in the last five years. With that and the numbers of people using them. So we need the infrastructure to support our changing facilities and, and, and make it a safe space for us for women to be in our fleet. I just want to add to that too from an overall facility point of view. Some of the investment that's happening in other venues is changing facilities, it's gyms, it's lighting, it's picket fences around over, it's video upgrades. We're trying to make we're trying to make little facilities 
um, I guess, the pinnacle of the local community, which um, inspires young people who want to uh, try to get to the best. And we're investing in programs, we're investing in coaching, we're investing as much as we possibly can to give these young people an opportunity to grow. Um, but facilities are critical. Deputy Mayor Fisher with a question. Thanks, Aaron, for your presentation. Um, along with the Mayor, I was uh, privileged enough to have a whole meeting at the Adelaide Football Club, and there's probably a, a few questions that we know the answers to that the General Councillor may not. So I just want to just touch on a few things. Um, is it true, in a question form, is it true that the every other uh, SANFL club has ownership or involvement with the council, their local council? That's correct. Okay, and you talked about ownership over here. So what's the situation with South Adelaide Football Club? Um, my understanding is the, the land and the buildings are owned um, from the state government, which was established back in 1990. 2003. Oh, 2003 was finalised. And am I right in saying that the council has um, an arrangement with the South Adelaide Football Club to maintain the surface area? Yeah, I'll ask of, of, the, of, the, of the council. Yes, that is correct. Um, so how do you see, so picking up on what Councillor Jew said earlier, mm -hmm. what sort of model do you see where we contribute other than advocacy that would involve the council? Well, I think that's financial. We need, I mean, we need these facilities upgraded and I suppose it'd be good to get in a room together with the state government, Sandford, Council and see how we can proceed with that. Yeah. What about the ownership of the? I think that's that, I think that's up for grabs as well. So who currently owns it? Well, the Minister for Sport currently owns the over, and I think, and we certainly whether other members of and previous councils have been in discussions with uh, our Office of Record Sport, they would happily transfer the lease to Council. However, Council have shown a reluctance to take up that opportunity to this point. Okay, that's all the questions I had. Thank you. Councillor Roulette with a question. Uh, yes, uh, just a general, general question. Uh, we are uh, given the benefits in uh, dollar terms uh, for sport in, in general. And I'm just wondering if uh, there is actually a figure for the amount of injuries and the cost of, of those. Thank you. Uh, in terms of it as a, as a negative cost involved yeah. from sport, um, we haven't we haven't looked into that. We've looked at the positives of sport and uh, and uh, and all the benefits and the health benefits. I'm sure they significantly outweigh those of a, an injury perspective. Um, um, but I would say that the insurances that are put in place through the AFL and through the samples of South Adelaide Football Club um, to make sure that athletes do get involved with the South Adelaide Football Club have the, the best cover they possibly can. Councillor Roulette, were you suggesting, due to the poor quality of the facility, had they had any reports of injury, or are we just talking no. about player injury? No, no. I, I mean, we've got a couple of uh, reports in, in front of us uh, uh, related to other sporting activities absolutely. on benefits, and it goes up to $100 million on something. Oh, yeah, uh, absolutely. To have that balanced uh, would be good. For instance, uh, uh, just to mention one thing, net, netball, mm -hmm. sudden stopping, highly injurious, uh, no netball is uh, going after 30, et cetera, that type absolutely. of thing. Absolutely. Thank right. you for clarifying right. can that. I just, can, I just, okay, can I just answer question, that question as well? Um, one of the things that we've been able to do that we've done at South Adelaide is that we have a number of our senior players and underage players, when they suffer serious injuries, we pay for their we pay for their medical costs. We've done that, you know, on a number of occasions. The number one draft pick last year didn't have private health cover. And Caleb Daniel, who's now played 20 AFL games, he didn't have private health cover when he played at South Adelaide and he's, you know, was a resident within within the city of Ongaringa. So we've been helping our families. While their children being playing sport out before club. Councillor Platten with a question. Uh, thank you, and thanks, Darren, for your uh, overview. It was really great. Um, so I had a bit of a read, and from what I can understand, there's an $8 million plan, give or take. I mean, it's probably going up every day. Um, and you've already secured a, uh, around about a million or a million and a bit. Um, in your best case scenario, sitting down in a room with state and council, taking out the fact that council doesn't own any of the asset, what 
financial contribution are you looking for from council? Uh, good question. Um, look, I, I think over the, the next couple of years, it's, you know, it's probably over one to two million, you know, and as you say, the escalation in costs yep. is uh, being significant. I think we, our project, which was 1.38 months ago, is now 2.3. Um, I don't doubt that we can have conversations again with the state government as to what that is, but we're talking about staging what we want to do. It's not $8 million tomorrow. It's, yep. you know, it's over a couple of years, and that $8 million includes... You know, netball courts and uh, volleyball, beach volleyball courts potentially as well. So, you know, it's over a period of time. Okay, I've got a couple of questions. Um, have you read the report? So the report, um, as I read it, really simplified. Um, it's actually saying that we advocate for funding through the state government, yet in the executive sum summary, it says seeking funding from council amount um, unspecified. So are you happy at this stage that council is not putting any funding in? However, we are advocating alongside with you for state government funding, because that's what this report is saying. Uh, we're not happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just advo ad um, the advocacy. Um, obviously, it's, it, it's, it's great and supportive, but to get a solution long term for the South Adelaide Footy Club and the, and the South Adelaide community, um, we need to find a solution greater than advocacy. And it may not be in the short term, but it needs to be in the long term um, between state government, between the local council um, to, to find a solution that works. Otherwise, we're going to get left behind and we're going to be band-aid fixes um, for the next few years. And how long have you been advocating for towards this project? This one's one for Neil. It's been a while. Well, Chair, yeah, you're one of the few people that's been in the room for a period of time, so... Mm -hmm. It would, well, I've been CEO for seven, and I reckon I've been here, I reckon, six. I'm sorry. I've been CEO for seven, and I think I'm, I'm sorry, Heidi Greek. Yeah, she's chair. been around a long time too. Yeah, as well. And I think I've been in the council chamber before. Now, there were people representing South LA Football Club that were in the council before asking the council for uh, help out with our deposition, which is now down to $60,000. So we're not, you know, we're not asking, we're not doing that ask again, but, you know, clearly um, it's been six years and we We've advocated with two governments as well, and I think mm -hmm. the chamber did support. And I think you were involved working in government at that time, so you weren't involved in the decision. But the the council mm -hmm. chamber did uh, commit to ninety thousand dollars with the state government scheme, which we then the Labor government round four was abolished by the mm -hmm. coming mm -hmm. Liberal government. So many years. Are you prepared? Um, because maybe the tactic isn't working to work with council staff and try a new tactic on gaining some funding. Well, if it's not, yes, I'm going to suggest it's not working mm -hmm. um, and we need to go a bit harder. Part of that discussion came out with a, a meeting with the previous acting mayor and okay. acting CEO, which was this report was table, uh, sorry, the, the, this report was commissioned by the then mm -hmm. deputy mayor. Uh, and then it was amended at the hit, at the meeting to not provide any, and not provide any financial support for South LA. So certainly the intent of those discussions was to have, is to what you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. However, it, it may not have come across like that the way the report was tabled okay. in the council chamber. Absolutely. And a final question, you mentioned change rooms and I've heard this multiple times. Um, how many times have you applied to the state government just for upgrades of change rooms? So how many times have you gone through their grants processes? I reckon between the state and federal. Yeah, absolutely. Be, be three to maybe five times that we've submitted. And unsuccessful every time. Yes. Oh, no, sorry, not unsuccessful. We had the election promise from the state government, okay. so the incoming state government mm -hmm. for a million dollars, so that was successful. Yeah, okay. So but prior to that, under the previous government, we missed out a couple of times. Absolutely. Thank you, Neil. Um, Councillor Jew with a further question. Um, I just wondered, at this time, can we ask a question of staff or is it actually through the motion? If it's not to do with the report? Um, it probably is to do with the report. All right, well, let's test it. Go ahead. Um, I just wondered, um, I noticed in the report that the sport and recreation strategy is um, more centred around, like it specifically it, um, says that it's um, around grassroots support of clubs. Um, and I wondered when that strategy is up to re for review. Uh, uh, through the chair, um, that current strategy is until 2025. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you, councillors. Any further questions? There is no further questions. Thank you so much for your deputation. If you want to take a seat because you're the first agenda items, you'll be able to hear the debate from councillors. Thank you so much.
Um, elected members, we now move to 7.1 South Adelaide Football Club Venue Improvement Plan. The motion is in front of you. Councillors, what is your wish? You can press your buzzer now. Deputy Mayor Fisher, to move. I'll move it. And would you like to debate? Uh, not at this stage. Okay, Councillor Greaves to second and some debate. Yeah, I might. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, although I would have liked to ask some questions, but that's okay. They may come later. Okay. Um, look, um, I think some of the, I guess, challenges around um, ownership of South Adelaide Footy Club are things that have been barriers in previous um, uh, attempts for funding. Um, I do think what I want to say is, you know, I, um, the deputation raised um, some issues around um, investments in other Sandful facilities, and they're great. It's fantastic. But I think there are some unique challenges, even apart from the ownership um, of the actual facility itself, in terms of the councils that have supported um, some of those grounds. Ideally, you know, um, they're they've probably got money in the bank. They don't have the same sort of budget position we're in um, and they're not growth councils, probably with the exception of the Elizabeth one or the Salisbury one. Um, but I'll ask some questions further on in the in the discussion, but, you know, this, this is a unique situation and there is a reason why it keeps on coming back and why it continues to be, I guess, unsuccessful in getting council on board. Um, not to say that it's not important. Um, it is just that it is a very challenging situation and I think it comes to a head and it clashes with, you know, the discussion we just had around our budget, you know. The reality is we don't have a lot of wriggle room. Um, we have in the past committed to funding, um, co-funding um, for some grants, um, and I think, as was mentioned before, that was uh, that was disbanded. So, unfortunately, that was a missed opportunity for council to actually contribute a significant amount of money. Um, at this stage, I'll leave it there, um, and I might ask some questions a bit later. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Wilkes, questions or debate? A couple of questions. Go ahead. Uh, can you just run through the peppercorn lease with me? Pardon? It's, it, yeah. I just wanted to get uh, yeah, through the chair. So um, the peppercorn lease that South Adelaide Football Club have mm -hmm. is with the state government. So it's for 100 years and it's a dollar a year. Okay. And do we provide all the maintenance and uh, maintenance for the oval? Uh, through the chair, yes, the oval is included in our grounds maintenance program. Okay. Do we charge for that? Uh, we have a sponsorship, sorry, through the chair, we have a sponsorship agreement with South Adelaide Football Club um, and that's provided in kind. Okay. And my last question is, so essentially the funding that obviously is not on the table but has been suggested from local council wouldn't go towards our asset as such because it's a state government asset but it would just kind of help our community members. Is that right? Through the chair, are you referring to the sponsorship agreement or funding for this project? Funding for the project. Yeah, so the, the funding is to upgrade the facility, so there would be um, community benefit, um, but obviously it is for the state government asset in South Adelaide Football Club facility. Yeah, so we don't own the facility. Thank you. Councillor Roulette with a question or debate. Uh, I just uh, would like to, just, I guess you could call it debate. I'd just like to Go make ahead. a statement as a new councillor. I I feel that there's a, um, it's quite difficult. But, uh, I haven't got my head around the sport and activity uh, recreation plan 21 to 25. Uh, there is no balance sheet here on, on revenues coming in from this. I've got no idea on what expenses are allocated. So I'm in the dark. Thanks. Um, Councillor Roulette, just to know, there's, um, we can't make a lot of financial decisions in SDC. However, when that report comes back to council, I would, I'm, probably going to be assured by council staff that that information will be in there for you. Yeah. Um, no, we will with a question. Thank you. Um, my question is about the naming rights of the venue because they were granted to Flinders University in 2018, so which means they're beginning to probably come up for sponsorship. I'm just wondering what steps we're taking about that. Uh, through the chair, that's an agreement between South Adelaide Football Club and Flinders University. I don't know whether you, know, you want to provide any more comment on that, um, but it was a five-year agreement, so yes, it would be coming to the end of that term. Through the chair, two more years, as indicated. 
Councillor Drew with a question or debate? Um, question, thank you. Yeah. Um, I wondered if South Adelaide Football Club are a for-profit organisation or not-for-profit? Through the chair, I believe they're not-for-profit. You'll see going, yes. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And um, also, I wondered if there are examples where, um, so when we think about our strategies, like I sort of asked the question before around um, the sport and rec um, strategy and when that's up for renewal, um, the case that South Adelaide put before us in relation to the work that they're doing in the grassroots um, and also um, in terms of making it accessible for multicultural background, um, children and young people, women, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community, um, demonstrates to me that they are actually trying to provide an inclusive opportunity. So I'm wondering if there are examples within council where although it's not within the strategy, we have sort of worked outside of that um, because of a, a solid case. Uh, through the chair. Um, in, in the terms of this with South Adelaide Football Club, I think our avenue has certainly been advocacy um, and we want to be at the table to support um, South Adelaide and work with Sandville in terms of getting funding for this project. So it's sort of outside of our strategy in terms of what our focus is, um, but certainly um, advocacy is that key avenue and something that um, we probably haven't been that active um, in regards to and we're certainly committed to doing that. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like? Is there, is there data and information that we could also be providing to support their case to state and federal government? Uh, through the chair, um, yes, we provide some, we do gather data, um, but obviously um, South Adelaide Football Club would be able to provide very accurate and thorough data as well. Um, through, through the chair, um, Councillor G, um, advocacy is quite can be quite powerful and leading into election times, leading into budget times are, are the key opportunities. I suppose the challenge is that I think that most people would say that there could be um, uh, great opportunities for the, pre the, the Oval, the club and the precinct itself and within our city. And the challenge has been um, the policy framework that this the um, council has adopted, which is through the sport and rec framework, there, there will be some alignment, but not full. Um, and the decision to invest in um, local clubs, and that's been where the priority has been for, for council. Now, that's not to say that, that a new chamber may change its mind, but we also have to be realistic around uh, um, uh, asset management plans, uh, budget constraints, and where does it sit within our priorities? And um, we we meet with the Office of Rec and Sport. We're very open to continue with the discussions. And there may be opportunity um, yeah, similar with, with the upgrade to Hopgood Theatre at some point in the future that we, we'd be willing to, to discuss. But um, I think it's fair enough, given the, the costings for the expansion plan and the upgrade, that but we council's position has been that it is a state government asset and state government should be investing in their asset. And at some point in time, um, that if that investment was made, there would uh, it may be a time for council to have a, another conversation. So I don't I don't want to close the door on that and and policy change and um, uh, advocacy is effective and and just to just to note the um the last election between the federal government and state government this this council achieved uh, more than 24 million dollars in and some of it was 100 percent funding for projects so I, I don't underestimate the uh, the power of advocacy councillor greaves with a question um so the acting chief executive has just um probably answered part of the question so this um, this issue has had a very long history. Um, we've seen um, uh, master planning. We've had lots of conversations. We've gone down the road of having a look at, you know, a, a council and South Adelaide um, Football Club um, investment around a whole range of um, sporting facilities in that precinct. Obviously, it hasn't come to fruition. But the question remains about, you know, ownership. Obviously, council's policy is. Um, not to invest in facilities that we don't own um, in broad sense. But have, have we actually had those conversations with the state government about what it would look like if, that, if we were to actually take on ownership of that asset? 
I'm not suggesting it's a great idea at this point in time, but uh, through through the chair, we've had some initial conversations. Councillor Fisher with a question. Yeah, through the chair, a question for staff in relation to, I mean, one of the sticking points, my understanding was this grassroots um, definition that excluded uh, South LA Football Club because they used the word elite. Um, clearly, they have demonstrated in the presentations earlier tonight that uh, it's more than uh, covers that particular definition. What have we done to ensure Rec and Sport uh, are aware of that? Uh, through the chair. So when you say Rec and Sport are aware of it, do you mean council, our staff? Yep, through the chair. Yes, I understand. Thank you. Um, yes, that would be um, part of the discussion and making sure that that um, business case and that background information and that um, community benefit is certainly part of the advocacy um, to city government. Mayor Will with a question. I'll just get you to press that button one more time. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my question is really about have we explored um, non-sport and rec mechanisms? For example, the when we when the Deputy Mayor and I met with um, President Margaret Nyland and Neil Sharp recently, we talked about some of the other things that council might be able to do. For example, the young Indigenous players that come down here, providing mentoring, employment opportunities, you know, things that are a bit more outside the square um, that would actually make visible to um, the state government and to other authorities like philanthropic, philanthropic foundations our commitment as a council to this community and the good work that the that the footy club's doing? Uh, through the chair, I think there's uh, been a long-standing sort of relationship and partnership with South Adelaide Football Club on a number of different levels, um, including ha having events and things like that there. In terms of exploring um, more so those sort of community programs, um, I'm, I haven't been part of those conversations, so I'm unaware, but it's certainly something that we'd like to continue the conversation with South Adelaide on. Councillor Ouellette with a question. Uh, I guess it's uh, a debate. Well, You've already debated, unfortunately. Uh, so if you can okay, right, master right, that into just, a question. Just um, that it's important that uh, there's a, there's a uh, some cash coming back if uh, to the council. I, I was lucky enough to be involved uh, so is your question a, seeking if council invested there'll be a return on our investment the council yeah yeah so uh, there would be, be a return on an investment yeah, when it's a state yeah. government owned yeah. facility yeah because i i say that port, uh, that south adelaide i grew up with south adelaide football club and uh i'm, I'm got a very uh, favorable um so I, feel, I hope something happens but there has to be some benefit for council absolutely i'm sure south adelaide look forward to working with you um, elected members, there's no further questions. I'm going to go to Councillor Wilkes with a question. You're going to go straight into debate. Go ahead. Yeah, the um, Sandfield Clubs, and it's really like quite a sad outcome, I believe. Um, it's disappointing for our community and for South Adelaide that they are stuck kind of with these facilities and the state government, um, the owners do, do not want to kind of provide the updates that the facilities are in need of. Um, I just think it's great that that the, our local council is providing the annual sponsorship packet and inc package, including ground maintenance of the oval and the use of no, the no longer aquatic centre. And I think that it would be really great to see a kind of a wholesome approach to a solution here because it's obviously still not going to get the upgrade that it needs. Go ahead. Uh, through the chair, I just wanted to um, let uh, Councillor Julie raised about the economic benefits. Um, it's actually provided an attachment three, which is the information provided from um, South Adelaide Football Club and it's sent through data. Okay, now we'll go to Deputy Mayor Fisher to close debate. Thank you, Chair. Uh, some significant debate there, which was really good. Uh, the four dot points is what we are voting on tonight. So I'll ask you to attune your mind to those particular four dot points. Any decision ultimately down the uh, line of ownership, funding, everything else will obviously come back to this chamber. Thank, Thank you, you, Deputy Mayor. I'm going to put the motion. All those in favour? 
please signify. And against, that is carried unanimously. Thank you, elected members. Elected members, now let's move to 7.2, the future use of the Frank Smith Park Oval for organised sport. Presentation. And there is a presentation. Yep. Uh, through the chair, uh, thank you. Uh, we've got a presentation tonight um, whilst you're considering future use of Frank Smith Park for organised sport. We just wanted to provide some further background to the report table tonight. So parks and open space, including Frank Smith Park, play an important role in the well-being of our community sport, relaxation, exercise, socialising and connecting with nature. It is important that we consider how the park can continue to serve the needs of the community. Frank Smith Park is no exception. It is highly valued by the local and broader communities that use it. And we'll talk you through that tonight. In terms of site context, as you can see on the um, map, We've got uh, Frank Smith Park is located in Coromandel Valley, which is in our northern planning district, and it's the green dot on the map. The park is off McGarry Road and is located on the edge of the Sturt River and forms part of our boundary with the city of Mitcham. You can see the red outline is the boundary of the property. Frank Smith Park is well used by locals for recreation, including walking and dog exercise. The key features of the park include an oval, a wetlands, path linkages that allow access from the Sturt River Linear Park to the Mayor National Park, um, BMX tracks, and a range of natural environments and habitat for wildlife, wildlife in the park, including the southern brown bandicoot and many species of woodland birds. Council has been undertaking ecological restoration activities in the park for the last 10 years. The oval area, which is indicated in green, is used by local schools for education and sports. We have a license agreement between council and the Department of Education, and that oval is a home ground for school competition sport. But besides the Frank Smith Park and the diversity of spaces and landscapes, organised sport has been um, played at the oval and has not impacted other users. These are just some images of Frank Smith Park showing the um, oval area and the cricket pitch. And it's an unirrigated, leveled open space with a concrete pitch, and it's got no formal drainage system. This is an example of the oval in use for school sports, a typical Saturday morning school soccer use, and it, you can see the informal parking that's used around the oval. Community land management plans are legislative documents required by council to lease or license use of community land. All of Frank Smith Park is categorised as developed reserve and sits under council's reserves community land management plan. To enable increased sport use of the park, the oval area needs to be recategorised to sports ground and included in council's sports ground community land management plan. To change a community land management plan, community engagement is required before seeking council approval to amend. So any increase in sport beyond the current school use requires the change of community land management plan. And this is the timeline of the events, including council decisions. This is an attachment to your report. Hopefully you can read it clearly. <laughs> so as you can see, there have been a number of reports and decisions by council regarding increased use of Frank Smith Park for organised sport. On the 19th of October 2021, a deputation was made by the Coromandel Valley Ramblers Cricket Club and State Lions for use of Frank Smith Park. A notice, notice of motion for staff was made so for staff to work with Coromandel Valley Ramblers Cricket Club and the State Lions Football Club and relevant stakeholders to progress options to accommodate the needs of sporting clubs at Frank Smith Park. In February 2022, an in principle support was provided for future use of Frank Smith Park for organised sport and that was to support club advocacy for sports fields. The report noted additional research in con consultation with the City of Marion and key stakeholders for district sports fields needs, and we'll touch on that in a moment. The report also noted that any of the improvements need to be considered in context of other major sport infrastructure projects across council. As part of that meeting, a permit was approved for State Lions Football Club to trial junior soccer for their 2022 winter season. 
And in June, 2020, June 2022, a deputation and petition against future use of Frank Smith Park um, was tabled at the council meeting, which was after the community engagement that we held. So I'll touch on it again in a moment. The deputation received from Coromandel Valley Ramblers Cricket Club was in support of use by organised sport. In October 2022, the community engagement feedback report was tabled, highlighting outcomes from the community engagement, and that was the link in your council report. We noted that a report to inform the future use of Frank Smith Park for organised sport would be presented to council uh, in 2023, and the report tonight responds to that resolution and informs the next steps for Frank Smith Park for organised sport. So as you can see, we've just got um, highlighted right here of where we are, which is tonight, the 4th of April for the SDC seeking approval to commence community engagement. And then down below the next steps is subject to um, SDC approval. Okay, um, so to inform a, a decision on the future use for Frank Smith Park, um, two key pieces of information uh, of work were undertaken to provide the information. Uh, the first one was a um, turf and pitch study needs analysis, uh, where we surveyed 14 sporting clubs in the catchment of Mitcham Hills um, and the north of Onkaparinga. Um, and we focused on participation facilities and future aspirations of clubs. Um, the study confirmed that club participation and demand for sports fields in the catchment area. However, there's limited um, large turf spaces not already in use. Um, this has warranted the investigation of increased use of Frank Smith Park um, for organised sport. Um, as Joe touched on, um, following the decision of um, in February 2022, state lines were, were um, granted a, a trial permit for use of Frank Smith Park, and this happened on the started on the first of May to the 30th of October. Um, we've reviewed this use um, and. Um, have found that the club used the oval five times during this trial period um, and that through seeking feedback from the existing users, um, no noticeable difference was reported um, on that, that increased use, albeit very, very small increased use by the, the club at that time. Um, we also sought feedback from um, surrounding residents with a letter drop um, at the end of the trial period. Um, and there was, yeah, limited, again, limited impact um, on, on the on the park. Um, however, concern there was some concern from um, one of the residents around high impact sport if that if it was to be used for that. Uh, the other piece that Joe touched on was um, some significant community engagement that um, occurred between April and June um, last year. Um, we sought feedback from the community on the um, potential increased use of Frank Smith Park for organised sport. Um, this was tabled at the October council meeting last year. Um, in summary, the majority of the 879 survey respondents, which was a great response, um, supported the increased use for sport. But we also noted that the park is highly valued for its, um, by the local community for its natural amenity and connection to nature. Um, this was really important. We also um, noted that there's some, there's some main community considerations in terms of increased um, sport at the park that we will have to, to consider. Um, these are access and parking, um, impacts on the natural environment and impacts of sporting infrastructure. Um, so in terms of um, what we have in place at the moment, there are existing controls which uh, to manage the overall use. So currently with the school sport use on match days, vehicle access is provided through the gate, which is unlocked when games are permitted. Um, we can continue to effectively manage that through license conditions as we do now. And we can include designating parking areas, times of use and signage. So traffic and car parking at Frank Smith Park will also continue to be uh, monitored over time if increased use is approved. Our suggestion with regards to the future use is to find a balance not an increase in intensity um, of usage by sport, just the frequency um, and which can be monitored through short-term payment arrangements. In terms of controls for, for natural environment, so the open space is typically a shared space and it is flexible in use. And as you saw on the map before, it's a large area and it's got a lot of different uses. Our aim is to achieve the balanced use to retain the natural character while supporting some increased use by low impact sport. 
And you'd see that there was a table um, as part of your attachment to the report, which just outlined how we've assessed and determined what low and high impact sport is. And only lower impact sport is recommended and would be controlled through license conditions again. In terms of sporting infrastructure, we're not recommending high impact sport. There's no infrastructure requirements for low impact sport um, and certainly not club rooms proposed. In terms of proposed next steps subject to um, SDC decision tonight. So if it is approved, we'd undertake community engagement to understand uh, the sentiment to change the overall area to sports ground into the sports ground community land management plan. And then a report will come back to council um, with the outcome of that community engagement and subject to findings seek approval to amend to the sports ground community land management plan. And we would notify clubs. And just as a side note, we are um, working with the Office of Recreation, Sport and Racing to advocate for sporting club access to school sports facilities, which is a challenge. Any questions? Councillor Eaton, um, would you like to move? I would certainly like to move. This and debate. Yes, this is a unique park or oval. Um, unlike the other ovals in this area, this is right on the border of the council areas and there is a lot of pressure in the northern areas in respect to um, the resources I've got available to play on but certainly the residents a lot of the residents don't want a massive park built there with lights and that sort of infrastructure even the CFS actually use it for training one thing I did notice during the um, the soccer season was that the oval did get dug up and I actually sent some photographs to you and uh, it's actually lovely to visit it. Uh, Tessa would often often go at least once a week and just to see the enthusiasm from the dog running around. Lots of other areas there she can run at, but the oval is just magic. So certainly there is a need for us to go through this process. Also being mindful of the traffic implications and particularly for those people on McGarry Road, you've got a unique old church there that's private residents and other residents. But McGarry Road, uh, Ackland Hill Road and Main Road create a major traffic accident potential. So if there's a lot of traffic in there, there is always the risk of frustrations, it's got bends and things can happen. But certainly I support as written. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Fisher, would you like to second? I'll second and I've got a question. Go ahead. Uh, so, uh, Council Eaton just talked about the safety aspects of the roads around. So, I'm, I'm familiar with the area as well. So, that uh, main road, uh, Blackwood, down at Coromandel Valley. But what uh, mediation or what um, uh, what have you got in mind at all, if anything, about a separation between sport and motor vehicles, for instance? <laughs> Uh, through the chair, we're not proposing any uh, traffic treatments um, as part of this. The, the oval is currently used for school sport on Saturday, so it's been used um, in that format. What we're proposing is that there would be the option of Sunday um, sport as well. Um, okay, maybe make myself clearer. Uh, the user group, have they considered maybe putting netting around that side so that a ball doesn't go on the road, for instance. Uh, through the chair, uh, that hasn't had any discussion and that hasn't come up. That's something we can certainly talk to the clubs about. There's no further questions. Councillor Eaton to close debate. I will put the motion. All those in favour and against, and that is carried. Thank you, elected members. 7.3, the Christie's Beach Sport and Social Club Expansion Business Plan. Is there an update from council staff? Yes, there is. Go ahead. Yep. Uh, so through the chair, the update on the report, there's been some email correspondence uh, from Mr. Jolly of the Christie's Beach Sports and Social Club to elected members and the acting chief executive. Copies of those emails are provided in the elected members folders tonight. Mr. Jolly requested an update to SDC to advise the club had not been notified of the report meeting date until the 29th of March. A response was provided to Mr Jolly today by our acting CE. The email is included in your photos. The response highlights the efforts of staff to notify the club about the report and apologises for any misunderstanding. A subsequent email from Mr Jolly to elected members is being handled as an elected member inquiry and a response will be provided. 
The report tonight responds to the specific resolution of Council from the 20th of September 2022. While the report doesn't directly align to the club's expectations, it presents an assessment of the club expansion plan aligned to Council's strategic direction and priorities and budget constraints, along with potential alignment with the Office of Recreation, Sport and Racing strategic priorities. The report recommendations aim to provide a positive pathway and opportunity to work with the club in good faith to align to the redevelopment proposal with Council and State Government's funding priorities to use to advocate for full funding. Councillor Wilkes, what is your wish? I would like to defer this item, please, until the... So you're moving in a completely different motion. Please read out your wording. I have that somewhere. I would like to defer this motion. <laughs> to? To June. The, the June, June Council meeting. Strategic is... Directions oh, Committee strategic. meeting. Thank you. Councillor Wilkes to move that this motion be deferred to the Strategic Directions Committee meeting of June 2023. Um, would you like to debate? No. Well, we haven't got a motion on the table, so this is the motion that's being proposed. I think it's, are you taking this as a formal motion? Because we've got nothing in place. This is not a formal motion. Because we've got nothing in place. It's not formal. Motion. So go ahead, debate. No, thank you. I'll just, I'll test You don't want to explain. That. Okay, no problems. Um, Councillor Patton to second. Well, can Councillor Patton explain the reasoning for deferring? I'm more than happy to uh, explain. So I... In the fairness of giving people enough time, um, Mr Jolly has approached the council and said that he would like some more time to uh, do a deputation that he feels is appropriate to go along with this uh, particular piece of work. Um, and so we would like that to happen. Um, he's indicated that that would be appropriate in June. And so we're asking the chamber uh, to test the chamber to see if that would be appropriate. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor Fisher, would you, questions or debate? Go ahead. He keeps turning it off. Um, Don't touch it. Thank you. Um, I'm for the motion, my debate, um, and um, I, didn't nom I didn't nominate or second the, the motion, but I was, had been part of uh, a committee that has actually uh, sat and listened to uh, the Christie's Beach Sports and Football Club and Sports Community Group. Uh, and my impressions were pretty well much what uh, the chair of that organisation reported back. So I think allowing more time for them to come back to answer those specific questions and uh, debate the point or talk to the, the, the debate is certainly reasonable. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, there's no further questions or debate from the floor, so I'll go back to Councillor Wilkes. Councillor Wilkes, would you like to close debate? I'll get you to press your... Thank you. Go so ahead. in closing, yes, I uh, thank you, Dan and Mick. That's uh, summed it up beautifully. I think as also one of the ward councillors that uh, kind of is, uh, well, Christie's Beach Sport and Social is situated in our in our ward. When someone asks you for uh, for a little bit more time, I think it's fairly reasonable to give them time so they can uh, plead their case and we can assess it at a future SDC. Perfect. Thank you, Councillor Wilkes. I will put the motion um, as on the board at the moment. All those in favour and against, that is carried. Thank you, elected members. There are no further motions. No, we'll move on. 7.4, Resilient South Sector Agreement 2023 to 2028. Elected members, what is your wish? Councillor Eaton, to Certainly move. I'd like to move as written. Uh, would you like to debate? Yeah, just go that um, I did have the opportunity to uh, go to their last meeting and see the enthusiasm from this group. And it really is the southern um, council areas in the city of Adelaide getting together and getting our, looking at climate related issues. And it lines up with our response plan or action plan and those sorts of things. So it is an important uh, initiative. Thank you. Thank you for that background, Councillor Eaton. Councillor Wilkes to second. Yes, please. Would you like to debate? Yes, please. Go ahead. I just wanted to say I found this report, like Councillor Eden, uh, warming. I thought some of the initiatives really stood out, like how they do the heat and tree canopy mapping, the urban forest management, the coastal ad climate adaption, and they support climate-ready schools and climate-ready communities. So definitely uh, support this one. 
Deputy Mayor Fisher, question, debate. Yeah, sorry, it's out of left field. How much do we pay for the heat mapping software? You have to take and I'll one. take it on notice if you don't know. Uh, through the chat, I will take that one on notice um, uh, because recently it has become something that's done at state level rather than at individual council level. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Any further questions or debate? No further questions or debate. Councillor Eaton to close. No, Councillor Rillette, question, debate. Uh, just a question. What are the costs to uh, cancel uh, projected costs? Through the chair, um, it's it's a thousand dollar contribution a year for our council. One thousand dollars per year contribution. Thank you, Councillor Roulette. There's no further questions or debate. Councillor Eaton, would you like to close? I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Everyone has to vote against. That is carried. Thank you, elected members. Seven point five. Council and committee reporting schedule. What is your your wish, elected members? This is where you press a buzzer. Councillor Eaton to move. So I'll move. As debate. Well. Yep. No. No debate. A seconder, please. Press your buzzer, someone. Councillor Platten to second. Would you like to debate? Uh, no, thank you. No. Mayor Weir, a question, debate. No problems at all. Councillor Eaton to close. Okay, all those in favour? Against? That is carried. Thank you, elected members. Uh, elected members, we have some questions on notice from yours truly on the First Nations Advisory Group for you to read very interesting responses there and further questions on notice on the Homelessness Roundtable. That response is in your yellow folders. Um, there is no um, new motions on notice, new petitions. Is there any urgent business from elected members? No, no urgent business. Confidential items, new, and I will close the meeting at what is the time? Someone yell it out. 8.40. Thank you, elected members. Well done.